Roger, for uh, those kind words and uh, making it possible for Brentwood Baptist to not just be a name, but a living, breathing congregation. So I really enjoyed my brief time with you so far, and I'm looking forward both to uh, our discussion tonight and tomorrow. So my name, again, is uh, Jeff Wyma. Like, why ma do I have to do this, and why ma do I have to do that? And uh, you can see, let's see here on my first slide, there it goes, you can see, see my two middle initials, right? I was predestined to be a New Testament professor. <laughs> and so I've been doing that for, I'm starting my 26th year, I can hardly believe it, at Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan. In our circles, we refer to Grand Rapids as the New Jerusalem, okay? I know that you have a better New Jerusalem when you think about the term, but uh, my wife and I are originally from Canada, but because of this teaching position, we've been called to the New Jerusalem of West Michigan, and that's where our home has been. We have four children, three of whom are married, and we have five grandchildren, and, and all of that is good. All of that is really, really good. So thank you for honoring me with your time. Time is very valuable. And like Friday night, that's like, whoa, that's an exciting night to do things. And to schedule something like this on a Friday night for you to come, I'm, I'm giving thanks to God for uh, your presence this evening. And again, hoping and praying that it will be a positive experience. I'm thinking of Jude just for a second. You know, Jude starts off by saying to his readers, I didn't want to write this letter. Jude said, I had another letter in mind. He said, I wanted to write to you about the salvation we share. And then he says, because of some serious circumstances, I instead had to write a different letter. I had to write a letter to challenge you to contend for the faith. And I feel a little bit like that this evening because... I'd rather talk with you this evening about the salvation we share, something that's like raw and a beat, and I like it when people laugh. You, you did already a little bit. Thank you very much. But the truth is, um, there are some subjects that, even though we're maybe not so excited to talk about them, they're important subjects, and there's a lot of pain and sensitivity around them, and, and yet they nevertheless need to be discussed. And so that's I, that's the situation I find myself in this evening. So please know that I do like to laugh. I love it when you laugh. And if you come tomorrow, we'll have a chance to laugh as well as learn at the same time. But, you know, the subject tonight is, I mean, hopefully there's an occasion for a chuckle or something like that. But I recognize that it's a, it's a serious topic. And before I formally start and work through all those hand, PowerPoint hand, handouts, I, I want you to know that this is obviously not a full discussion we're going to have, right? It's a very narrow discussion, right? We're, we're saying, what does the New Testament say? And there are all kinds of other physical, you know, medical, sociological things that we could and ought to talk about as we round out this subject. And so I hope you'll be kind to me, right? I know about all of that, but I'm not here that long. And, and as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we do believe that, that our views shouldn't be what we want, right? Our, our beliefs are not predicated on our desires, our wishes, but we profess, I, I, I'm pretty sure you do here with me, that they have to be grounded on the scriptures. And so it seems appropriate that we begin somewhere important, namely, what does the Bible say on this particular subject? And, and let me say by way of passing, everybody, almost everyone, has an opinion on the business of same-sex activity. But even though everyone has an opinion, very few have an informed opinion and very few have a biblically informed opinion. I could give you examples even of seminary students, you know, who have an opinion, and yet when I push them, and I, I, have, I have to push them gently, of course, but it, it becomes clear that they don't even know what texts in the Bible even talk about the subject, let alone what those texts mean. And so one of the passions I have is for the church, not just Brentwood Baptist, but Christ Church, as it faces pressures from culture and society on this very important issue that we at least know well our foundation, our starting point, that we have a good understanding of what the Bible says and what it means. And so that's my goal for this evening. So we're going to go for a while, and I'll follow the slides that you have, and uh, I don't know how long it'll take because... 
you know, I don't always time this out, and sometimes I talk more than I planned, even though I speak way too fast, right? I, I sometimes joke. It's true. When I was in high school, I had a nickname. Uh, I, I didn't pick the nickname, of course, <laughs> but uh, people called me Motor Mouth, all right? So, okay, you understand why, right? And <laughs> in fact, one teacher, I'm not kidding you, one teacher said in front of all the class, we were on, a, on an outdoors trip. We were kayaking, you know, uh, right? We were going like this, uh, canoeing, I should say. And he said in front of everyone, and sound carries on the water, he said, Wyma, why don't you stick your head under the water and use your tongue as a propeller, all right? <laughs> so... so. So I, I speak fast, right, and it allows me to get a lot in, but you have the notes in front of you, and so you can relax. You know, you might want to fill some things in along the way, but you can concentrate on what I'm saying so we get a good grasp of, of the issue and what the Bible says. So we're going to go for, I don't know, maybe an hour. There's a place I'd like to break. We'll take a break, and then we'll finish the discussion, and then we'll see what time it is after that. I would like to give you a chance to ask a question or two, but I'm not so sure if that will work out. But at least that's our tentative schedule, and we'll see how things go. Are you ready to begin? Good. Well, thank you. Let's go. So I have preliminary introductions and then preliminary comments before I finally get going. I want you to know that I know people who speak to this issue from firsthand experience. All right? I always feel weak when I go somewhere and I don't speak as authoritatively as I would like. And the truth is, I'm not attracted to the same sex, and so I'm a little less authentic right, on this particular subject than those who have that attraction might be. And so I want you to know that I'm in conversation with, and I know those kind of people, and, and they're informing you know, my big picture understanding of the topic. Some of you will be familiar with this Dr. Wesley Hill. He's like me. He's an egghead New Testament guy, and he is attracted to the same sex, but he believes that the Bible doesn't allow him to act on his orientation. And he has a book that many of you might well know. It's well worth reading, Washed and Waiting, as he talks about growing up in a conservative evangelical environment and yet having these feelings and attractions and how that went for him. Here is a, another person I know and sometimes work with in my denomination, uh, so this is why I'm talking about it, our denomination is wrestling with this issue and I didn't pick to be on this little ribbon panel, but anyway, God and his providence uh, work things out that I'm not only a member of this uh, special committee, I'm co-chair of it. And anyway, there are other members on this committee, and one of them is uh, Mary Lee, my friend Mary Lee, and she's a minister in our denomination, and she's attracted to women. And she actually acted out on that early in her life, but she came to the realization that Scripture, again, did not permit that kind of lifestyle, and so she doesn't live that way, and she's part of our committee uh, dealing and giving us advice on how to handle the discussion. And then Lori Krieg is a person who lives in Grand Rapids, my, uh, my now hometown, and she also is a woman attracted to other women, and yet she too believes the scriptures don't allow that, and she actually is married and has a family, and her and her husband have a special ministry dealing with uh, these uh, particular issues. So those are at least some of the people. I just want you to know, okay, that, that um, although I don't speak as authoritatively as someone with the same sex attraction would in my mind, I certainly uh, am hearing uh, those people and thinking about their situation as, as we wrestle with these texts. So three preliminary introductions followed by three preliminary observations. So there's that denomination that I belong to. You probably haven't heard about it, Christian Reformed Church. Although I might say, although I better be careful, I might sound proud, but we were actually the ones who started the NIV. Have you ever heard of that? You have heard of the NIV? You haven't heard of the New International Version? Oh, okay. So, anyway, it's published also in Grand Rapids uh, by Zondervan Press. Anyway, our denomination makes a distinction, and it's a good distinction, between orientation and activity. Orientation and activity. Between an attraction and acting out on that attraction. And the truth is, you need to recognize that the Bible doesn't speak explicitly or directly about orientation. It does speak directly and explicitly about action or activity. And that's why the title for our presentation is The New Testament and Same-Sex Activity. And 
And so that's uh, observation number one. And then observation number two, preliminary observation is, we have to be careful not to um, rank sexual sins in general, and especially same-sex sins, as worse than other sins. There's a tendency for the church to do that. And in our own excuse, I mean, it's understandable maybe why we're a bit preoccupied by sex, because the truth is we live in a culture that is preoccupied. So it's not just Christians who are kind of caught up on that, as sometimes people say. I mean, our culture and society is too. And so because we're so part of that society and influenced by that society, it's no wonder that we kind of pay maybe too much attention. But here's a list we'll come back to later in detail. But just for now, this list, look at all the people that Paul talks about who will not inherit the kingdom of God. He mentions the sexually immoral, the idolaters nor adulterers. Then here's that key phrase we'll come back to later, men who have sex with men. Thieves nor greedy nor drunkards nor slanders or swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm saying we have to look at not just the one phrase, men who have sex with men, we have to look at their other activities, right? There are other actions in that list that we ought to take serious and we, and we often don't. Um, I could talk about slanderers, you know, that's like gossiping in a malicious way. No one here, of course, is going to say that's a good thing. But we typically wouldn't say, oh, somebody who slanders will not inherit the kingdom of God. Somehow we don't think it's that bad. Or greedy, um, we live actually in a culture that celebrates money and people who are good at making money. And, and the church often, you know, doesn't think ill or just looks the other way at some church members who have more than enough money. You know, they just seem, seem obsessed with money, even though they have more than enough you know, to live on. And, and again, just a reminder that um, we shouldn't overemphasize sexual sins in general and especially same-sex sins. And then a third preliminary comment is the most important, so important that I'm going to mention it at the very, very end. So you'll know that I'm at the very, very end when I come back to this. And so um, I'm trying to emphasize it, right, by mentioning it both once at the beginning and uh, another time at the end. And that is the church needs to do a lot better job at demonstrating empathy, compassion, encouragement, all these other words that could be summarized by the word grace for those who have a same-sex orientation. And the church has not done a good job on that. Now, I, I don't know about your situation. I'm talking about the broad Christian church. And I am talking about my own tradition because I know that we at least have not. We have these reports in our denomination. Look at that date, 1973. That's a good long time ago. So already about 50 years ago, our denomination had to admit what? It is one of the great failings of the church and of Christians generally that they've been lacking in sympathy and concern for the blight of the homosexuals among them. So I hope that you won't get lost with all the exegetical details, all the biblical text and technical things I'm going to be talking about, that you don't forget that I began by stressing the church's need to demonstrate, big summary word, grace. And I'm going to end at the very end for the church's need to demonstrate grace. Did you hear me say that? You did? Okay, I want to make sure. Okay, so, all right. Well, now that we've got the preliminary introductions out of the way, now that we have the, the preliminary observations out of the way, we kind of roll up our sleeves and we say now, well, what does the New Testament have to say about same-sex activity? And it's common for many people, especially more progressive people, to make this distinction, which is not really a good one, frankly, and that is to distinguish between what Jesus said or didn't say and Paul, right? They, they like to separate out these two from each other. And, and one of the reasons they like to do that is because, well, from their point of view, there is a tension between the two. And they end up having to choose one or the other. They have to either choose what Jesus says or what Paul says, and, and this is why I don't like the division, all good Orthodox Christians, you know, um, we, we don't have, you know, the phrase, a canon within a canon, right? We don't rank the books of the, we may have favorites, that's okay, but we don't rank them in terms of like, one is more true than another one, or one's even not true as opposed to those who are, and so there's a big problem with this dividing the testimony of Jesus from the testimony of Paul, but that's often the argument that is made. So I'm actually adopting a progressive position because that's likely the position that you're going to hear, right? 
I mean, you're going you're to meet people or maybe you're going to read something. And this is a common claim. And so I, I want you to be prepared for the kind of arguments that are made so that you can think about the proper response to those arguments. So, for instance, uh, some people like to say, I follow Jesus, not the Bible, right? It maybe sounds good, but there are some big problems with it. But the key argument goes like this. If same-sex activity was really that big a deal, if it was really that terrible, then how come Jesus didn't say anything about it, all right? And so that's a common claim that is made, and maybe that sounds persuasive to you. Maybe that sounds impressive to you, but maybe you'll change your mind in the next couple of moments, all right? So here are some responses, and response number one, I wouldn't tell you there's response number one if there weren't at least response number Two, and there'll be three and four, so just be prepared that there'll be a couple of different answers that we're going to come to. So the first thing we have to recognize with, and, and, and feel free to say, duh, when I say it, okay, but sometimes we have to say things, you know, because they're true, right? And that is that Jesus was a Jew. Yes, he was a Jew. And there's no question at all, I mean, Everyone that is scholars who know anything about Judaism, especially Judaism of the ancient world, everybody recognizes that Judaism, when it came to same-sex activity, said strongly no. Right? There was no ambiguity. There was no debate. I mean, Judaism had a consistent, uniform answer. And so, so because of that, that meant that Jesus grew up in that environment, that Jesus probably shared that view, unless if he didn't, he would have probably said so, right? Jesus did differ from his Jews on a number of things, and, and he did say some things that people back then found shocking, but, but then he would clarify, he would teach it, he would make sure, right? And so we should assume, unless we have texts that say otherwise, that Jesus shares that Jewish perspective. Point number two. Now, you may not like me if you have with you tonight a red-letter Bible, all right? But there are actually some problems with a red-letter Bible, right? Because somehow we're saying that the red letters are more important than the black letters, right? There was this, wasn't Carmen a few years ago had a Christian song, I'm going to have a red-letter day, the song said, right? I mean, that's, that's a nice song, right? That means I've, I've read the red letters, and I'm going to live by them today. And, and again, there's nothing technically wrong with a red-letter Bible, but you somehow send the message that there, again, is a difference between the red letters, what Jesus said, and the black letters, what Paul and what the rest of the biblical writers said. And we have to recognize that well, wait a minute, um, behind the biblical authors, behind these secondary authors stands the primary author of Scripture, right? And that is God working through the biblical writers through his Holy Spirit. And so there aren't multiple gods, there's one God. So there's a fundamental agreement, right, among the Scriptures. There's a fundamental unity among the Scriptures. And so we, we can't put these two in tension with each other. And in fact, Paul, and it just happens to be from Thessalonians, you may or may not know that I'm a Thessalonians kind of guy. I've spent a lot of time in the little letters of, Thessalon of, of, of First and Second Thessalonians. But Paul, writing to the Thessalonians, says, I give thanks to God because you Thessalonians did something. And now I'm quoting them almost directly. He said, you received our words... Not as the words of men, but as they truly are, the words of God. Okay, so, so Paul had a sense that God was speaking in and through him. And so again, we can't separate what Jesus actually didn't say from what Paul did say and somehow think that what Jesus didn't say is more important than what Paul did say. All right, okay, even though, again, this is a common claim that is made. Response number three. This is what we call, and we are mean scholars, an argument from silence. In other words, you don't hear someone say something, and then from the silence, you draw a conclusion. It's a really dangerous thing to do. So let's imagine I'm speaking tonight for like two hours or so, and you're wandering out of the building, and you say to yourself, now, you know, uh, Jeff Wyma, not once tonight, referred to his wife, Bernice. Not one time he mentioned her. And then you say to yourself, I wonder if he really loves his wife. You can laugh now, hopefully, because I don't. Okay, okay, good. Okay. So, so, you see, that's an argument from silence, right? You didn't hear me say something, and then you draw a 
conclusion. It's very dangerous, right? There, there may be a good reason why I didn't mention my wife Bernice as I did now for the second time, right? It just, it's not the form or the context or whatever the case may be, right? And so it's very dangerous to, to say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about same-sex activity and therefore he would have been okay with it. And besides, if you follow that logic, you end up with, well, conclusions that no one would agree. I mean, Jesus actually never says anything against prostitution. Not one time. Jesus never says anything about incest, sex among family members. Jesus never says anything about pederasty, sex between an older man and a younger male teen. And Jesus never says anything about bestiology, sex with animals. And surely no one is going to make the argument that Jesus would have been okay with any of those things, right? So, so it's really not that convincing to say Jesus never said anything about same-sex activity. Therefore, he didn't think it was a problem or it wasn't a big deal, right? You can see this person on the poster. As Jesus said about gay people, and then what's between the quotation marks? Nothing, right? As if somehow that is significant. This is an argument from silence, and be careful about such a claim. Response number four. Now, Jesus doesn't directly say something about same-sex activity, but he does seem to, what, allude to it. We have the text in Mark 7 where Jesus talks about all these different things that defile a person, and then he mentions one thing, and there's that NIV translation, which actually is the most uh, popular English translation for some time now. It translates the word in Greek, porneiai, as sexual immorality, singular. But that Greek word is a plural. More literally, you would say uh, sexual immoralities. So in other words, Jesus apparently knew there was more than one way that you could act sexually that was wrong, okay? Right? So Jesus knew there was more than one way. Now, he doesn't say what all those ways were, but do you think Jesus knew the Old Testament, by the way? Yes or no? What do you think? Probably, okay. And so in the Old Testament, which lists a number of these ways, right, it's at least, again, not a direct reference, but there is actually a, a, a reference to sexual activities, sexual moralities, right, which is a broader umbrella term which would include same-sex activity. So I'm ending the testimony of Jesus by quoting someone, and, and now you can find people you can even find scholars to justify any position, okay? Because that's not hard to do. So it's important for me to make you know that the person I'm citing is a weighty source, it, okay? In other words, you should listen to this person. So this book was written a few years ago, Robert Gagnon, and it is widely recognized, not just by people who have a traditional view on same-sex activity, but even progressives. If, if you're advocating a more progressive view and you want to talk about conservative view, you're going to cite this guy over here because he's widely recognized. This is not a very user-friendly book, right? I mean, you can buy it if you want, but it's not a light or easy read. It's an egghead New Testament kind of guy like me who in a very detailed way, but it's widely recognized as an authoritative voice on this particular subject. So, so he's worth listening to. He's, he, okay? And what does he say? The portrayal of Jesus as a first century Palestinian Jew who was open to homosexual practice is simply A, that is non-historical. All the evidence leads in the opposite direction. So remember, we've divided the testimony of Jesus from the testimony of Paul, even though I don't like to, even though there's something wrong with that. And, and so now we've hopefully heard a number of reasons why the argument from silence is really not a very weighty or significant argument at all, all right? So I'm going to leave this argument behind, right, the evidence of Jesus, and we move now to the Apostle Paul. So uh, Paul, uh, I'm not saying anything new, but, and you're welcome to say duh again, but it's worth repeating that, that Paul was a Jew. And so what I just said to you a minute ago about Jesus is just as true for Paul, right? Remember I said that Judaism of Paul's day, Judaism of the first century and centuries before and centuries afterwards actually, they were uniform, right? They were in complete agreement in rejecting same-sex activity, and so we should assume the Apostle 
Well, maybe Paul was a liberal Jew, right? Maybe he was a Jew who didn't know the Old Testament at all. Is that possible? Oh, yeah, you can laugh. Okay, yeah, very good. Because isn't he the guy who said, I went to the Harvard School of Judaism, right? He trained at the feet of Gamaliel, and that's where you're supposed to go, ooh, right? Because, I mean, even the New Testament says Gamaliel, right? I mean, this Jewish rabbi was highly respected. And, and not only that, Paul in Philippians talks about how he was, what? He wasn't at the bottom of the class. He was at the top of his class, right? Okay, and so, yeah, of course, Paul not only is a Jew, he, 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 he not only knows the Old Testament, he's like a super smarty pants kind of Jew. And even more than that, he belongs to a group of people called the Pharisees. Okay. You, you, by the way, the Pharisees aren't the same as the Sadducees, right, in the Essenes and the Zealots. The Pharisees are like super conservative. I mean, they're so conservative that, well... <laughs> I mean, they follow the priestly rules for holiness even though they're not priests. <laughs> In fact, the word Pharisee likely means the separated ones, the separated ones. You see, these are Jews who say it's not enough to separate ourselves from Gentiles. No, no, no. We Pharisees, we're going to even separate ourselves from fellow Jews, at least those Jews who aren't as conservative, who aren't as passionate as we are about the law and so forth, all right? And so I want you to understand that, that Paul's like Mr. Smarty Pants, gone to the Harvard School of Judaism. He's super conservative. And, and so all of that, again, you should assume, unless he says otherwise, because Paul did say some things that his fellow Jews would disagree with, right? Things that got him into trouble. But unless he says otherwise, you should assume that he probably shares that same Rejection of same-sex activity. Here's a quote from David Garland. And uh, he says, Though homosexual acts were generally accepted in the ancient world, right, by non-Jews, right, it was generally accepted, Hellenistic Jewish texts. So Jewish writers from that Hellenistic Greek-speaking time and part of the world were, what's the word? Unanimous. Yeah, I wasn't exaggerating when I said before, right? Unanimous in condemning them and treat them, namely homosexual acts and idolatry, as obvious examples of Gentile moral depravity. Not surprisingly, Paul shares with his Jewish, with his Jewish aversion to idolatry and homosexual acts. Can I sow a seed for something in a minute to just look at this quote for a minute, because he rightly, Garland rightly says, from a Jewish point of view, Jews thought about Gentiles, and when they thought about Gentiles, they said to themselves, you know, Gentiles, you know, they're, they're typically guilty of two things, okay, right? What are the two things that Jews typically think Gentiles are guilty of? One is, it's in the quote here, it's in, one is idolatry, right? Because the Jews are going, here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, right? And so, so Gentiles don't do that. They worship all these Roman, Greek, Egyptian gods, the imperial cult, right? They're guilty of idolatry. The second typical Gentile sin from a Jewish point of view is sexual immorality in general of all kinds. And of course, same-sex activity would be one branch of sexual misconduct, right? So I'll come back to that because this will explain what Paul says in Romans 1. We'll get to that text right after our break. Back to Paul again. Now, Paul, forget about same sex for a minute, okay? Forget about same sex for a minute. Just think about sexual topics or activity in general. And Paul is pretty conservative. How do I know that? Well, we'll just look at what he writes. He's got a whole paragraph there in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, and a couple of commands are pretty strong. And I'll just read part of it. He says that you should avoid, that's a strong word in Greek anyway, sexual immorality. You should have nothing to do with porneia, with sexual immorality. And that each of you should learn to control your own body in a way that is what? Holy and honorable. Not in passionate lust like the, Gen remember I told you Jews thought that Gentiles were guilty of idolatry and sexual morality, right? So, so Paul is pretty conservative here. Maybe you know of Paul's writer, writings to 1 Corinthians. So the, in, in that church, there was a man uh, who had a sexual relationship with his stepmother. This is chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. Not his natural mother. Uh, it was his stepmother. So it wasn't his natural mom. It was his dad's wife. We don't know what happened to the dad. Anyway, they were living together. It was a sexual relationship. And, and Paul, what does he say about that? He's, he's pretty ticked off. And he's more ticked off 
with the church than he is with the man, by the way, okay? So, because Paul says, you guys should have, you can't tolerate this. You should have done something. And then in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he, he finds out that some of the Corinthian Christians are going to prostitutes. And he goes like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you serious, right? So, so Paul is pretty conservative and speaks pretty strongly about sexual misconduct in general, in fact, in Ephesians, before I go any further, right, he goes even one step further. Among you, there shouldn't even be a, right, even a, a, an aroma, or even just a whiff of sexual immorality, right? So these texts show that in sexual matters in general, forget about same sex, in general, Paul is pretty conservative, yes. And so, I mean, that's the context now when we turn to his more narrow discussion of same sex activities. We should expect him, unless he says otherwise, that he's going to reflect that particular view. And that indeed is exactly the case. So here we come to the three key New Testament texts that explicitly deal with same-sex activity. So there aren't many, but they're relatively clear, they're consistent, and they're compelling. And so for the next few moments, I want to do 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It's going to take a little while to do that. I'll say just a very quick word about 1 Timothy 1, 10, and then we'll take a break. Because we need just to catch our breath, because the Romans text is the most important. It's most important because it's the longest. It's the most important because it deals not just with male same-sex activity. It also deals with female same-sex activity. And it's the most important because... Unlike the other two texts where Paul just says it's wrong, it's inappropriate, in Romans he gives a reason why it's wrong, okay? That's the big thing about Romans. He gives a rationale. What's the problem with same-sex activity between women and between men? And so we need to catch our breath a little bit and, uh, you know, give our brains a rest so that we're ready to pick up the discussion after break. So, so that's where we're going. So let's spend our time talking about 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Actually, we read it just a little bit earlier in my preliminary uh, introduction. So here comes again the same text, and now we're going to focus on the part that is relevant for our discussion this evening. Paul says, or do you not know? And by the way, when Paul says, do you not know, the answer is, yes, you do know. Right? Why do I have to tell you? Right? Okay, you understand? <laughs> okay, so there's a little bit of uh, frustration in Paul's voice, you know. In fact, in these chapters, there's about, about 13 times Paul says to them, don't you know this and don't you know that? If I said to my students at Calvin Seminary, like in, in one class, like multiple times, don't you know this and don't you know that? They start sinking in their chairs, right? Because, because they rightly perceive that I'm assuming they do know it, and therefore, why do I, you know, so, so, so this is one of those texts right there, and Paul says, you know, don't you, would be maybe a better way to translate, you know, don't you, that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God, and don't be deceived, and here comes the list. Now, sexually immoral is listed first, because remember, he just finished chapter five, talking about the man having a sexual relationship with his stepmother, and he's going to be talking about Christians going to prostitutes, so he puts that in the front of the list, right? In other words, we're going to be emphasizing something that Paul is not emphasizing. Did you hear what I said? So we're doing something tonight. We're focusing on same-sex activity, even though Paul never, ever focused on it, right? He, he refers to it, but it's only in passing, right? Because, well, frankly, it wasn't an issue in any of the churches, and so he didn't have a need to deal with it in detail, right? But he mentions then sexually immoral, because that's part of the context, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor, and then this is how it's translated, men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So in bold, there are a lot of words there, nor men who have sex with men. In Greek, there are two words. So for the next long minutes, I'm going to be talking to you about the meaning of two Greek words. Sounds kind of technical, doesn't it, right? But don't bail on me, right? You can handle it. You can understand it. It's actually important that you do. And I want to stress that because many people who want the church to add, you know, to have a more progressive view on same-sex activity, 
You're going to hear this often. They'll come to these two words, and they'll either translate them a particular way, and I'll explain how in a minute, or they'll say, this is very common, New Testament scholars have no idea what these two words mean. And you're like, how would you know, right? You don't know Greek. You're like, oh, I guess so, right? Okay. So I'm here to tell you, no, uh, some, in fact, many New Testament scholars do have an idea what these two words mean. And I've got four different arguments. Whew, I'm tired already, are you? Four different arguments about what those two words mean, all right? So we're going to be talking about two words, but they're important words. They're one of three key New Testament texts dealing with same-sex activity. So we better spend some time, right, so that we can hear what Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was saying to uh, the church at Corinth. So there are those two words, and even if you don't know Greek, I put them in English. You can say them even in English. The first word is malakoi, malakoi, and the second word is arsinokoitai, arsinokoitai. And I could understand you. You should say, Wyma, just go to a dictionary. See that dictionary right there? That's like a standard dictionary. It's not conservative. It's not liberal. It's like super expensive and super heavy, right? It costs a lot of money. And it's like the widest use. Just look up what those words mean. Tell us what it means. And then we'll know what Paul means, okay? But there's an important principle that you may or may not have heard before. And it goes like this. Every translation involves interpretation. This is a saying of me, right? Every translation involves, I'll say now, some degree of interpretation. You cannot go from one language to another language in a completely neutral way. There are many, many occasions where the translator injects not just a translation, but an interpretation, okay? And so uh, you need to know that principle, that ought not to make you suspicious of your Bible. <laughs> but that explains why, you've had this before, right? You sit around a Bible study and you're reading a text and you just read a verse and then someone on the other side of the room says, that's not what my Bible says. My Bible says, right? And someone says, my Bible doesn't say anyone of them. My Bible says, okay. And, and then you're like, oh, right? Ever had that experience before? Yeah. Oh, you all have the same Bible maybe. You heard Brentwood Baptist, did everyone? Oh. Anyway, so there's an example, again, where the, the translators not just translated something, they, to some degree, interpreted, and, and that leads to some confusion on our part, especially if you don't know the, the language and the issues behind it. So, so, so now I'm going to say, now, how to translate these two particular words. Now, some scholars, and they tend to be more progressive scholars, uh, people who want the Bible to accept at least some forms of same-sex activity. Some scholars want to translate the first word as pederas and the second word as male prostitutes. I don't know if you know the word pederasty. It's actually misunderstood. It doesn't refer to sex between men and a baby. I know. Pederasty involves sex between an older man and a... It could be a boy anywhere from 10 to 16, 17, 18, okay? And it wasn't just sex. There was a, a special kind of relationship, all right? And pederasty refers to this particular relationship between an older man and a, a young teen, a older boy, something like that. And the second word, male prostitutes, that's pretty understandable. That's a person who sells their body, right, for money, who has sex for, for cash, now, if this is the right translation, with me? If it is. I'm going to suggest it isn't in a minute. But if it is, such people will say, you see, Paul is not against all forms of same-sex activity. He's only against particular forms of same-sex activity. What kind of forms? Well, the first one, pederasty, that's an abusive relationship, right? You have an older man abusing his power for a younger one, and so Paul there is talking about an abusive sexual relationship. And the second one, well, that's a different kind of abuse. That's a person who inflicts that abuse on themselves, somebody who sells their body for sex and misuses their body in an appropriate way. And so they draw a conclusion, 
they draw a conclusion that Paul is not against all forms of same-sex activity. In a very narrow way, they suggest he's only against certain kinds of same-sex activity, abusive forms or, you know, commercial sex. And what that does is it potentially leaves the door open, even though Paul doesn't say this, it allows Paul possibly, and they of course would seize the possibility, that Paul would accept other forms of same-sex activity, right? So a same-sex activity that doesn't involve abuse, that doesn't involve cash, Paul would be okay with. And so we end up with the phrase, you know, long-term monogamous same-sex activity. So it's really important how you translate these words, because if that's the right translation of the terms, that's at least a possible interpretation or conclusion. Are you with me? Okay, this is, this is a common argument. You might meet it if you read someone uh, who writes on this or if you hear someone speak on this. So, so now you have to evaluate that. You say, is that really the best interpretation? And I have, um, well, again, I said response number one, and I wouldn't list number one if there weren't at least number two. And I already warned you that there's three and four. I, I know, okay? But, but actually, this is serious stuff because there's a lot of weight on the meaning of these two words. And so it's going to require some ram on your part. I'm exercising your brain, right? And the subject is so serious, I can't suddenly interject with jokes and allow us to laugh like I normally do. But, but hang in there, right? I think we can do it, and we really need to do it because the subject is serious, and I want you and I want me to make sure that we do indeed hear what the text truly says. So, so here's one response. Now, if Paul were, in fact, only speaking about pederasty, actually, there's at least two different good words that Paul could have used in Greek to say exactly that. In fact, our English word pederasty comes from a Greek word which sounds almost exactly the same, right? There's a Greek word, pederasta, that, that Paul could have used. And even better, because remember there are two words here. Remember, there's the malakoi and the arsenikoi toi. But there's another good Greek word for the older man in this relationship and the younger boy. And so you have to ask yourself, if that is what Paul was really referring to, why didn't he use those kind of words? Because they weren't rare or unknown. It would have been easy for Paul to clarify his meaning if indeed that was his intention. Response number two. You've all heard the principle interpreting Scripture with Scripture, right? And so a little more nuanced version of that is, why don't we, our text, is our text very long? What are we arguing about? We're not even arguing about a verse. We're talking about what? Two different words, okay? So why don't we let these two words, this very short phrase, why don't we see if there's another verse in the Bible which talks about same-sex activity, which is longer and clearer. Maybe that longer and clearer text on exactly the same subject will clarify what this very short text means, okay? This is a good principle of interpreting Scripture with Scripture. Because again, we believe that the biblical authors are inspired by God and God fundamentally agrees with himself. And actually the longer text comes from Paul, so we're still dealing with even the same biblical writer. So the longer text, which is clear, is the one you already know about. It's the Romans one, which we haven't yet looked at, yes. We're going to after the break. But I'm gonna bring in now, just for a moment, okay? So two things about that longer Romans text which help clarify the meaning of these two words, okay? The first point goes like this. In verse 26, one of the unique things about the Roman text is it talks not just about men who have sex with men before it, it talks about women who have sex with women. And the reason that's significant is in the ancient word pederasty, pederasty, we talked about it a few times, right? didn't involve women. Pederasty was not an idea. It was an activity between an older woman and a younger woman. No, it was only between an older man and a younger boy, right? So if Paul in Corinthians was indeed thinking about pederasty, right, then in Romans he would have never referred to women. You see, see the logic? Okay. So, so because women, right, in the ancient world were not involved or seen as being involved in a pederasty kind of relationship, that doesn't make sense that Paul does have that relationship in this other text. There's a, there's a disagreement. 
And then another point, remember, if you're arguing for a more revisionist interpretation or a progressive one, remember pederasty. What's wrong with pederasty? It isn't same-sex activity. It's an abuse of power, right? It's an older person abusing, taking advantage of their power, right, for a younger person. Who's the guilty party in the pederasty relationship? Who's the guilty one? The older one, of course. Yeah, okay, right? However, in Romans, in Romans, there's a wee little phrase where Paul says, and I put it in italics, where he refers to same-sex activity. They were consumed in passion, and then you see that phrase, for one Another. Do you see the potential significance? In other words, Paul doesn't say one was consumed for passion for the other. He says they were consumed with passion for one another. He, he finds fault, so to say, with both parties, right? And so that also works against the claim that Paul in the Corinthian text is talking about pederasty, and he's against pederasty because it's a form of abuse, and that involves only the older person who's abusing the younger that goes against the Roman text, which Paul has both parties as responsible or guilty. So I, I'm, I'm a little nervous. I got some looks on your faces that says, I'm not quite sure if you computed all of that, but at least the good news is it's all there in that beautiful color handout, right? And maybe you can go back and think about that a bit more. But again, the argument that a longer, clearer text of Romans clarifies this shorter two-word text in 1 Corinthians 6. So we'll go on to response number three. Maybe I need to slow down a little bit because this argument's kind of complicated too. Brace yourselves. Are you ready? Brace yourselves. Okay, you're going to need to be with me. So, so now we're going to talk about one of these two words for a little bit. One of these two words. Remember there's two words. The first one is malakoi. And the second one is arsenikoitai. We're going to talk about the second word for a little while alone. Just the second word, arsenikoitai. And that's a, it's a kind of an unusual word, arsenikoitai. And, and scholars have said, well, where did Paul get that word anyway? And I want you to hear me say that there's a wide agreement that um, it's made up of two parts, and they come from... Uh, the Old Testament, Leviticus. First of all, what are the two parts? So you can see in red, arsenikoitai is the word. Arsen is a, a Greek word for male. And koitai refers to a bed. And uh, what, of course, lots of things take place on a bed. And one of the things that takes place on a bed is sex, right? And so it's assumed in the ancient world that a man, because it's a male-dominated society, will have sex on a bed with a woman, but yet now we have a male bed. So that means the person, the male person is going to have sex on a bed, not with a woman, but with a man. All right. So the basic meaning of male and bed is a person who goes to bed and has sex with another man. In fact, see those letters B, D, A, G there. Do you remember that thick dictionary I told you about that cost a lot of money, weighs a lot, right? And is, so that, that's like a standard definition. It says, it says exactly what I just told you. They explain that word as a male who engages in sexual activity with a person of his own sex, all right? So that's the common, common understanding of the term. But where did Paul get that word? And again, there's a common agreement that he got it from the Old Testament. And just, I know I don't want to insult you, but does Paul know the Old Testament? Okay. Is it probable he thought about the Old Testament when he was writing? I mean, you know, was it kind of like, you know, not at all. He never ever thought about it. Does he quote the Old Testament in his letters? Yes, he does. And so I'm suggesting not only when he quotes the Old Testament, sometimes he, I'll say, alludes to it. I, can go, some, I might go like this if I were you. you see, do you hear it, right? I hear an echo of the Old Testament. And especially if you're dealing with something that's kind of like ingrained in you. So, so I'm speaking, this is, this is fun for me, I'm speaking in front of a Baptist church. <laughs> and I'm not Baptist, okay, right? I'm like Calvinistic, right? And, and, and Calvinism is such a part of who I am, it kind of oozes out of me. I mean, I don't think about it, but I mean, I just, it's all in my background, right? And, and so when I say things, I say things that if you analyze my talk, you might say, wait a minute, he's echoing, he's alluding to, you know, this Calvinistic teaching or maybe what John Calvin said. 
I'm trying to give you an analogy that this is what Paul naturally does, right? When Paul writes and speaks, he's so steeped in the Old Testament that it kind of oozes out of him. Not just when he consciously quotes it, but even when he just talks in general, right? Ideas and terms and concepts, it's part of what shaped him. It's part of who he is. No wonder it, it kind of comes out. So, in other words, it's not at all a crazy idea. In fact, it's an entirely plausible idea that when Paul, possibly, when Paul used this word, he was echoing or he was thinking consciously or subconsciously, probably consciously because of something else we'll hear in a minute, of some Old Testament text. Now, there are two Old Testament texts, you can see them already, that he is likely alluding to, Leviticus 18, 22, and Leviticus 20, 13. Both of them are relevant, but in the interest of time, and not to, you know, to tax our mental RAM, we all have a limited amount of RAM, right, that we can handle all this stuff, let's look at the second one, Leviticus 20, verse 13. So even if you don't know Greek, let's first look what it says in English. And whoever will lie with a male as with a woman. So these are a couple of the key Old Testament texts which speak about same-sex activity and speak negatively about same-sex activity. Anyway, look at the two bold words. And you've got these wonderfully and I'm kind of surprised to say expensive color brochures, right? So you can see those bold letters in there. See those two bold letters, okay? So, so look at, remember, the Greek word we're talking about is arsinokoitai, arsinokoitai. Even if you don't know Greek, do you see that there? You see arsinos, koiten, right? I mean, the word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is actually right there in two parts, right beside each other. It's exactly pretty well the same as what he uses then. And this is why most scholars, most egghead New Testament people like me, believe that Paul then coined this word, or Paul got this word. How? Because he got it from the Old Testament. He was thinking of, if not Leviticus 20, 13, possibly Leviticus 18, 22. Now, you should ask yourself, so what? <laughs> There's a good answer to it. So why is it so important for you to know that when Paul uses this second word, he's likely echoing or alluding one or both of these Leviticus texts? Why? Because in Leviticus, Leviticus is dealing not with just one or narrow forms of same-sex activity, but the Leviticus text is dealing with all forms of same-sex activity. And if that's the background, then again, it's hard to argue that Paul was okay with certain kinds of same sex, right? Monogamous, long term, he's okay with that. He's just against either abusive forms or abusing yourself by selling yourself for sex. That argument becomes not so plausible if indeed, as most New Testament scholars uh, claim and, and understand, that the word arsenikoitai comes from those Old Testament texts. Whew, this is hard, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It, it takes a while to kind of let all this stuff think, you know, sink in. But I hope, if anything, I'm being very precise, okay? Because I'm not here. I didn't fly all the way from Grand Rapids to just let you know how I feel, right? Or, or I didn't want, I just think, or it seems to me, you know, no, this is much too serious for that, right? I want you to know that, that, that this is a biblically informed discussion, right? We want to know what the Bible says, what, again, uh, God was saying through Paul to the Corinthians in this particular case, to the Romans and to Timothy and the other one we have to look at too. Okay, so, so uh, here comes response number four. This is the last, no, okay, we're almost, this is the last one for the first text. So remember, we're talking about how many words we're talking about? Two words. And I just, point number three dealt with only one of those words, the second one, or synecoid. Now I want you to think of both of them again, all right? So now I'm back to the both of them. And again, the first one is malakoi, and the second one is, as you know, our synecoitai. And you should ask yourself, why does Paul have these two terms? Why, why didn't he just pick one? Is there something unique about the pairing of these two? Is that significant? Or not at all? And the answer is, it does seem to be significant that he has chosen these two words. They look like they're a pair. You, you know what a word pair is, right? You know, sink or swim, wine and dine, sick and... We have that in English too, words that occur not alone, but they occur naturally with a, another term, right? They, they need to be understood as a 
whole, right? And so I'm asking the question, malakoi, the first word, is it significant that it's paired with arsenikoitai, the second word? And here, let me explain to you more clearly what each of these two terms means, and in my mind, and it'll be reflected in the translation, refers to. First of all, malakoi. Malakoi literally means soft. Malakoi literally means soft. So, so I have a stick of butter at home, and I, you ever had that? I, I hate, you know, I, I, I open the butter jar, and there's no butter left, and then, of course, there's butter in the fridge, but that butter is hard, and then I chew up my whole bread, and I get all frustrated, okay? And so I like my butter to be malakoi. I like it to be soft, okay? That's what the word literally means. But instead of literally, it has a symbolic or metaphorical meaning. If you refer to a man in particular as being malakoi, a man as being soft, you're referring to a man who acts in a, well, not in a manly way. And even more particular than that, I don't want to offend anyone, but I need to be clear in what I say to you. So it refers to a man who what? Who doesn't act in a manly way, more particularly insects. It refers to a man who allows himself to be penetrated by another man. That's what Malachi refers to. It refers to a man who doesn't act in a manly way in sex. He acts in a womanly way. You need to clarify the view of same-sex activity in the Roman world. Sometimes I think it is claimed, I know it's claimed, and and sometimes people hear this claim, and they think that, oh, in the Roman world, people are okay with same-sex activity. Not quite true. Not quite true. It all depends on what role you're playing. If you play the manly role, in other words, if you penetrate sexually another person, then it doesn't matter whether you penetrate another woman or you penetrate another man. There's no shame in the Roman world because you're playing the male role. However, this is a big point. If you are malakoi, if you are soft, if you allow another man to penetrate you as a man, whoa, there's lots of shame with that, all right? So in the ancient world, it simply is not the case that they accepted all forms of same-sex activity. No, 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 no. It depended on whether you played the male role. No shame at all in playing the male role, whether you penetrate a man or a woman. No problem at all. Yes, they were okay with that. But it was considered shameful. By the way, ever heard of honor shame? I mean, in the ancient world, there were big deal on. And by the way, we're shameless here in the United States. We are, okay. But in, back then, and still in the Asian part of the world, that was a big deal. So it was considered shameful if a man allowed another man to penetrate him. So Malakoi refers to the man who allows himself to be penetrated. Arsinokoitai is the man who goes to bed to have sex with another man. He's the one who penetrates the other man, okay. The ancient world would say that's okay. Paul comes along and disagrees with the people's opinion of that day, right? Paul says, yes, culture says that malakoi is a shameful thing. Paul says being malakoi, allowing yourself to be penetrated by another man is an inappropriate activity. And Paul says, contrary to opinion of his day, it's also wrong for a man to penetrate another man. That might be accepted in society, but it's not accepted for membership in the kingdom of God. And so a good case can be made that Paul deliberately paired these two words. Why? Because he wanted to address both partners in a same-sex relationship. The passive partner and the active partner. And that's why he picked the two terms rather than the one alone, right? That's why it's important that they're paired Now, you probably won't believe me, you know, coming from Grand Rapids and being a Calvinist and all that, right? Yeah, don't believe me. But but notice I've got two translations here, and some of you apparently hadn't heard of the NIV before. I thought you did. Maybe you've heard of the ESV. You have heard of the ESV? Okay, yes. And are these like minor translations? No, these are, okay. So you maybe trust these things, okay? So, So both these translations do exactly the same thing, not only with the translation of this verse, but with the explanation of this verse. So both of these translations translate these two words as men who have sex with men, 
but they have a footnote. They have a little footnote, and the footnote reads exactly the same. I wonder if one plagiarized the other. How could that be? Anyway, so both Bible translations have a little footnote that says, quote, the words men who have sex with men translates to Greek words. You say, hey, yeah, that's what that crazy guy Wyma was teaching us about, right? Okay, that refer to the passive. Remember, the first word is malakoi, soft, and the active, the second word is arsina koitai, participants in homosexual acts. So I'm trying to show you that the footnote in both of these translations so to say, confirm or summarize the fourth argument that I just gave you, that the pairing of these two words is significant because it picks up both halves of the same sex relationship. In the ancient world, the person who penetrated, they were okay with that, but they weren't okay with a man who allowed himself to play the female role in a sex act and be penetrated. But Paul uh, disagrees with both. Well... There are three key texts. We're going to deal with two of them before the break. And we just spent a lot of time and energy, important time and energy, explaining those two Greek words. And if somebody comes along and tries to say, you know, New Testament scholars really don't know what those two Greek words mean, don't believe them. Okay. Yes, there's some disagreement about the meaning of those two words, but it's not at all the case that we have no idea at all. And depending on how convincing you found my arguments, I want you to at least recognize that there are one, two, three, four arguments that give us, I think, pretty clear certainty about not just what Paul says, but what Paul means in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. So there's one more text, and this is Rather short, and we're going to have a break in just a second, all right? So hang in there, just a brief reference. So the word arsenikoita, yes, you've heard that before. The, the second of the two words in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it occurs alone, it occurs by itself in 1 Timothy 1, 10. Again, it's part of a list. We call them vice lists. Paul has virtue lists sometimes in his letters. Sometimes he's got vice lists. And he says, in verse, I'm going to start at 9, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for the lawbreakers and the rebels, the ungodly and the sinful, the unholy and the irre ir irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for the sexually immoral. And then this is where the word arsenikoitai comes, and they translate it, that is the NIV, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. So we're back to our synechoitai, and remember arguments one, two, three, four. Remember argument three. Argument three, what was that again? Oh, that's where Paul is echoing. He hears the old, remember the two words, arsenechoitai, right? And I said that most scholars say that Paul got that word from where? The Old Testament from Leviticus 18 or 20, okay? Remember that was his claim. So most scholars say exactly the same thing because look at verse 9. By the way, where is Leviticus found? Where is it found? Is it like the prophets? Is it in the... Oh, it's found in the what? Oh, the law. Okay, so the word law here in verse 9 is an important context. You see, that all means Paul is already thinking about the Old Testament law and it strengthens the case that when he uses the word arsenikoita in verse 10 that he is indeed thinking about those Leviticus texts. And so the 1 Timothy 1.10 text strengthens or, you know, works with uh, the 1 Corinthians 6.9 text, especially the third argument. Well, friends, the third big text is Romans 1. And you've been attentive, and I thank you for your patience and your energy. But it's probably good that we have a break. And uh, it's always dangerous giving people a break, you know, because when are they going to come back? So if I say five minutes and you take 10, will that be about right? Does that sound good? Okay, so, so seriously, because otherwise we have a little bit more to cover, and I'm a little nervous actually about having time for questions, but I for sure would want to get through the Romans and the material and end on the note of grace. So enjoy yourselves, take a break, just sit, do whatever, but let's try to reconvene in about 10 minutes.